Good morning. Welcome to this service, this opportunity to worship our Lord and Savior. Pentecost is a season, it's not a day, at least in the Anglican tradition. And I'm so thankful that we are together. And this particular Sunday, we can tell the theme is going to be on the Lord's Prayer. It's not part of the uh, liturgical lessons, but it's one that's been on my heart for some time, and I'm thankful for that. Would you join me? Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come in your power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As you are all aware, in the last week we've had an amazing experience as Canadians with an example of killing in genocide. It's a situation which all of us would like to think never happens in our country, but it's obvious it does and did. So the bishop sent me a letter to share with you today. A bit long, but I would appreciate it if you'd, you'd listen to it carefully. On May 12, 2021, we hosted an online anic-wide prayer meeting for, the, for which many of you were able to join us. We had a pastor's meeting on that day. The theme was focused on 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and I will forgive them their sin and heal their land. That evening we pleaded with the Lord to intervene to arrest and remove the world from the world and Canada, the COVID-19 pandemic. And then Garth Hunt, our canon for prayer, led us on a meditation of our theme verse and rightly emphasized that God's promise of salvation comes from the healing of the Lord land first called upon by his people to humble themselves and pray. And in these last days, these last few days of all Canada are, has rightly been shocked and disheartened and broken hearted in the discovery of some 215 dear children all buried outside of a residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. It may well be there are more dear lost children who are yet to be found outside other residential schools across our nation. We are rightly appalled, dismayed, ashamed of these discoveries. At so many levels, we're ashamed. We know that it is the mercies of the Lord that he allows light to shine in darkness and things that were hidden are meant to be exposed, that they might be seen for what they are and the heart set right instead on Christ. Repentance is rightly called for because all children should be protected as precious and never be disposed of as if they were nothing. He didn't include it, but I think that's the same way about abortion. Children are being dumped in garbage bins from their mother's wombs. The Lord himself considers them precious, and Jesus declared, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Matthew 18, 5 and 6. Because First Nations and all indigenous people must not be forgotten, nor neglected, nor pushed to the sidelines in this land in which the rest of us have been so blessed to share and to dwell in. And because, tragically, the church shares in the responsibility in all of this. As we humble ourselves, repent, and seek God's face, how incredible it is that the same God loved the world so much that he sent his only son to die for our sins and for our sake, not to condemn us that we might find 
forgiveness instead, salvation instead, and life by believing in his name. And when the Lord disciplines us, his children, exposing our sinfulness, he does so not because he lacks love for us, but because of the great and abundant love he has for us. Consider this excerpt from Hebrews 12. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you to come as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord. Amen. This is from our Bishop Charlie Masters and uh, something for all of us to continue to pray about. I was thankful on a trip with my grandson on Tuesday that I discovered everywhere I went in the four-hour drive that there was flags down everywhere. I had not known that Trudeau had asked for that. I only assumed, and I said to my grandson, I said, you know, the fact that these are all down everywhere could only possibly be in, in honor of those children in Kamloops. And it turned out when I finally got to the news later on, I discovered that. And uh, I'm glad we're making an example of, of the things that are important in our lives. So we've got a lot to consider what we can do and how we handle it. The hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers of will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is welcoming such people to worship him. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Dearly beloved, the scriptures teach us to acknowledge our many sins and offenses. Not concealing them from our Heavenly Father, but confessing them with humble and obedient hearts that we may obtain forgiveness by his infinite goodness and mercy. We ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before Almighty God, but especially, especially when we come together in his presence to give thanks for the great benefits we have received at his hands, to declare his most worthy praise, to hear his holy word, and to ask for ourselves and for others those things necessary for our life and our salvation. Therefore, my friends, come with me to the throne of the heavenly grace. Together. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the deceits and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And apart from your grace, there is no help in us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those who are penitent according to your promises declared to all people in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O oh most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may now live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Our Heavenly Father pardons all who truly repent and genuinely believe in his holy gospel. For this reason, we beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit that our present deeds may please him. The rest of our lives may be pure and holy and that at the last we may come to eternal joy through Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, it comes to that understanding is when we confess, we know that he's heard and received our prayers and responded accordingly. We are free for our sins. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let's greet each other. <laughs> what a privilege it is, isn't it? To be able to stand together. For those of you at home, I hope you're doing high fives for those who you love and care for that are close by. And if you're watching this alone, there's one for us. The inventory. Oh Lord, open our lips. Oh God, make speed to save us. Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be. 
Praise the Lord. Be praised. The invitation. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us pray before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hear his voice. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. This morning prayer that we just said means more to me because I've been preparing the sermon and it fits in so logically with what we have just been studying and, and praying just now together. I'm going to invite Matthew to come forward and share the readings from John, 1 John. We were just talking, this is such a great passage, you know, it would be the subject of a great sermon someday, but not today. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, for if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might be complained that they are all are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One, and you all have knowledge. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. You know, Matthew, uh... I don't intend to do a sermon on this, but I can't help but understand the reality of how John, the beloved disciple, in writing 1 John and 2nd and 3rd, as well as the Gospel, has made a point that's so important to us. We are the children of God. He said that several times in that scripture, in that passage. Very important for us to realize what that means. That's a special significance. God, the creator of all, allowed us and invited us to become his children. The only priority, as you were mentioning in the scripture you just read, is that we make a decision for Christ. There are people who chose to not make a decision for Christ, therefore they're not his children. Sad to say, there are many people that are rebelling against the truth of the scriptures, maybe more now than ever. The devil, the antichrist, is working overtime, my friends. Please join with me in our prayer this morning. Father, we know you are the Lord God Almighty, creator of the universe, the earth and all that is. Let the heavens rejoice. You speak and the world acknowledges your glory in your son Jesus. Through your Holy Spirit, you speak into our lives. 
that we may live in peace and humility before you and others. We pray that we may see the power of your Holy Spirit working in our lives and empower us to tell the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, among the nations. We praise you, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Matt. Wonderful, opp wonderful opportunity now to share the words of a hymn that is titled Ancient Words, although the actual song is quite new. But it's a beautiful theme and understanding is that whether it's Genesis or Revelation, after at least 5,000 or 2,000 years, they are ancient words. But boy, do they make a difference in our lives. So I look forward to our team, Gord Gover and Jerry Bother. To, uh, to help us in this wonderful music to share. Lord? song singing about ancient words that really means something to us, doesn't it? Thank you, Gord. Wonderful sharing. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Watch out. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, when you pray, don't be like hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners and in the synagogues where everybody can see them. I tell you the truth. This is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to the Father in private. 
Then your Father who sees everything will reward, will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need before you ask. Pray like this, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, but if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. You probably know the words that we just read in this Matthew's Gospel. Because you've probably said them since you were just a baby. Just a child, we learned that. Some of us memorized it as part of our Sunday school classes. And as adults, we are also guilty of just saying them because we're so familiar with them. The significance of the Lord's Prayer isn't found in the words my friends, but in the topics that focus those words that Jesus intended us to use in our praying. What I mean is Jesus isn't teaching us the exact words we should pray in this message. He's teaching us the themes or the subjects we should incorporate into our prayers. Jesus is teaching his followers how to pray, not the exact words to pray, but rather acting as a model for us to pray. The Lord's Prayer teaches what to pray about. These words remind us to consider the critical points that we need to discern in our life, that we should be lifting up to our Father, so that you and I are able to survive in an upside down world. As Christians, we are discovering that the world we live in has vastly different values and morals from a biblical worldview. We need help. My friends, we need help navigating through the messages of this secular, anti-Christian worldview. That's why we say this very prayer almost every Sunday in this service, because we need the reminder. So, what does the prayer teach us? Well, let's dive a little bit into the themes and patterns that Jesus is giving us this morning. We have the privilege to speak to our God when we need help. When we seek answers. Isn't that astonishing? God, the creator of the world, and we're allowed by invitation to pray to him. We don't have to go through any intermediaries. We go directly to the heart of our faith. When we seek answers, we will hear his voice when we read scriptures, just as Matt read this morning. A tremendous amount of meat in those scriptures for us to consider. And his Holy Spirit guides us to interpret the word as it applies to each of us personally on that very moment. And sometimes we seek answers and hear his voice in a prayer. And it's a two-way communication, like a one-on-one -on -one chat. Sometimes we need to adjust our signals to connect even better. And I couldn't help but think of this smile. There's Jesus. <laughs> Facebook, you want me to 
communicate with you through Facebook, Jesus? No, I want you to follow me. Oh, so, like on Twitter? <laughs> and finally, I'm going to start again. And you can let me know whenever you lose it. <laughs> Isn't that so true? Part of the challenge we have is understanding how do we communicate one-on-one. -on -one. He says this very clearly. Oops, didn't want to go there, so I'm going to leave that on the screen. That's, I should have been a blank one in there for us. First of all, Jesus wants you to understand we, as followers of Christ, are family. Think about that. Jesus, the Savior of the world, wants us to understand that you can pray as you're part of the family. He teaches us our Father in heaven. The opening of Jesus' prayer seems ordinary to us who have grown up with it as Christians. But when he taught this on the Sermon on the Mount, on that wonderful Sunday, or whatever, like a long <laughs> bunch of chapters, it's incredible. When he was teaching that, do you realize that those Jewish people couldn't believe they were told to call God Father? That was completely foreign to them. They had no concept of that. To address God as Father? Jesus, what are you teaching? This is whom they thought of when you think of their names for God. And this is only a few of them. There's over a hundred of them. But for them, in Hebrew, Elohim, the creator of the universe, that's who they would be praying to. This awesome person. And I didn't even call him a person. Awesome God. El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty. That's who they addressed in their prayer life. Jehovah Jireh, when they needed something, they would go to Jehovah Jireh, God the provider, and there was many, many more. They would call him master. And of course, the most common term was Yahweh, which in our word means Lord. But there are over a hundred different expressions for God in Hebrew. But not one of them was Father. You can imagine what Jesus did at that moment on that hill when he said, address God as your father. Jesus, the son of God, knew God in a very personal way, obviously. So he teaches his followers who have accepted Jesus as their savior, it's a specific understanding. He treats them as family. He says, you're God's children. You've been adapted into the family because you know who I am and you've accepted me as your savior. Adopted brothers and sisters, that's what we are. And Jesus recommends and actually endorses in this prayer when he teaches us. He says, you can have a very significantly, very personal name when you call upon God Call him Father. Father is a particular word, and it's made accessible. When you think of God, it's kind of a bit awesome. But Father, much more accessible. And that's what Jesus is teaching. So those of us that have always said the Our Father, as friends of mine used to say, especially in the Roman Catholic Church, that's how they title this one. You know, we say the Our Father as opposed to the Lord's Prayer. But that's okay. But they take it for granted. They don't just understand the awesomeness that we have been blessed to be able to actually share in a relationship with God our Father. We take this for granted, I think. Do you think that when we say our Father, we just say, oh, here we go again. Close my eyes, I can do this one. God, the creator of the universe, is actually accessible to us. But he's also accessible in a very special, personal way to you and me. Abba, Father. 
It means a very special relationship that you have with Creator God. Jesus is teaching the disciples and us today that God is not a distant, remote God that doesn't care. He is present, and he cares. He's our Father, and we're to address him with reverence. Yes, indeed. That's why the next frame comes up, and that is, hallowed be your name. We need to pray, Lord. We need to pray, and we need to understand that you are holy. Since God is our Father, we can approach him anytime we need, but we need to, need to do this with a sense of reverence and awesomeness, acknowledging that he is holy and we are not. We can, however, come as we are, with all the challenges, the fear, the desperate nature we have, the challenges we face, we can come just with all of that to God our Father. And sometimes we come with thankfulness, but maybe not enough. <laughs> our Father, thank you for what you've done today in my life. But we should come into his presence with awe in all the cases. Don't take it for granted. We can come as we are, but we should not forget the reverence of the moment. Hallowed be your name. And then we follow the prayer Jesus taught, may your kingdom come. Our time here will end. This world will not last forever. We don't really understand that we don't belong here. That's, this is not our ultimate location. And that's okay. As followers of Jesus, our hope is not in the present world. Rather, our confidence is in the blessed eternal life that he has given us through his death on the cross. When he said, pray, may your kingdom come to our Father, he wants us to understand that our daily struggles, our trials and difficulties will ultimately be no more. God's kingdom is coming and we should pray that it comes soon. We are citizens, my friends, of another kingdom. And then we are taught to pray by Jesus May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, how many have said that prayer a bazillion times and ever stopped and paused and reflected and said, your will? Your will be done? We often think this is all about us. We're taking the time to pray to you. You taught us what to pray, so we'll rattle on through it but we don't spend any time on the actual message that we're actually asking for. This is a reminder that you and I are, are charged with building God's kingdom, not our kingdom. May your will be done. God's will is to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ, to turn a world that denies him into followers. That's his will. For us. God's will is to love him and his son Jesus. And then he says, and to love others as yourself. That's God's will. So when we pray that prayer, we rattle on through it sometimes too quickly. We need to pause and reflect what Jesus was asking. Are you we going to follow God's will, take the kingdom to the world? despite the challenges and difficulties that takes, means? And are we gonna love others as ourselves? We've got a challenge. There's a lot of people that do not know the love of God. They don't treat each other well. We've got a lot of poor and needy people in this country and around the world so what does he want us to do? Take the good news of salvation 
and support the ministries in this country, this area, this community, who are helping others and the needy. Go whatever way, sacrifice when necessary to support the needs of others. There's downtrodden in our communities, but that's also true around the world. So that's part of his message. May your will be done, we pray. And how are we responding to that? And then he told us, pray, give us today our daily bread. And you know what? It's pretty simple. This means the food we need, the clothes we need, the roof over our head that we need, and the opportunity to earn the money to have those things. Give us today our daily bread. In other words, God's interested in providing for us in the both here and the now and throughout eternity. Like any good father, God wants to promote, provide for his children. God cares for us. My friends, this prayer says it's okay to request our needs. Nothing wrong with that. But they're not meant to be self-serving wants, but what we need. Bread represents our physical and our spiritual needs. So pray for that. The material things we need to live this life and yet bless others. I think that's one of the biggest challenges of us giving us today our daily bread. The prayer is right. The message is right. Jesus was teaching right. But sometimes we become hoarders. We think, well, we've got the right. I work hard. I've earned this. And I don't need to share it. Oh, I might just a little bit. Just in case God's looking. He's always looking. He's always wondering what are we doing with our blessings that he has given us. And finally, his next message is, and forgive us our sins. Jesus taught us to pray to God our Father. Forgive us our sins. Even as sincere followers of Jesus, we mess up, my friends. Oops. We mess up. We make mistakes. But Jesus knows this. He knows that we need to do something very special. We need to confess. <laughs> For those of you at home, there's a neighbor's dog that just decided to punctuate the comment. We need to confess, and then he barked. So, I agree with you. We need to confess to maintain our relationship with Jesus. Forgive us our sins, we say. Forgive us me my sins. It's when we stubbornly maintain our pride that we break relationship with our God, our Father. Here's Jesus, and it's his instruction to us daily. Ask for forgiveness. Repent and turn from it. And then he made this statement. Sometimes a little more troubling. And sometimes we say it, but we don't really mean it, and we don't really ponder it. And we have, as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us, we pray for our forgiveness from our Father when we have messed up. We often are less inclined to forgive those who have messed up against us. The forgiveness of our sin is what we need to so that we can live confidently with God our Father. But our teacher, Jesus, makes this point. It's very clear that Jesus is teaching your forgiveness leads to forgiveness of others. They're connected. Absolutely connected. You can't ask for one and not grant the other. What's interesting in this is Jesus assumes that when you've been forgiven, you will automatically forgive others. That's how he said it in the prayer. Ask for forgiveness and grant forgiveness. He's not saying we should forgive. 
He's saying, you will forgive if you want forgiveness. That's the mark of true forgiveness. When we recognize the magnitude of our own sin, when we put down ourselves as self-righteous, that's a sin. And we don't want to forgive those who have wronged us. That's a sin. Man. And there's a but coming. You see, we can forgive others because it's God's grace that forgives us. He doesn't hold what we did against them. He gives us a second chance, a third chance, a 77th chance. But what he does do is expect us to honor the agreement, forgive others. That's what God's, God's grace is. God's grace is enough. The person who does not forgive a brother's offenses does not appreciate how much he himself has been forgiven. You and I cannot walk in fellowship with God our Father if we refuse to give others. If we forgive, wow. If we don't, look out. Forgiveness is the only way. This very familiar prayer takes on a different dimension, isn't it, when we consider just exactly what we are praying, the words. And then he said this, pray, and don't lead us, don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Jesus said that's okay. Pray to not let us yield to temptation. My friends, God is our strength in temptation. We are tempted to do things in our best interests and not others. There's a whole spiritual world out there that's trying to ensure that we get into greed, pride, prejudice, and self-serving. And the reality is we need God's strength to recognize the temptations when they come and the enticements to lure us into the evil circumstances. Greed is one of them without a question. I know that I'm speaking personally, but it is. But for some people, it's a challenge, and we're being lured. So the prayer that Jesus taught us, don't let us yield to temptation. Good prayer. <laughs> Wonderful prayer. It's worthy of possibly identifying what it is that might be on your heart that's a temptation. Because we need strength to overcome whatever it is we are facing. Could be lust. Could be pornography. Could be gambling. Could be not loving those who love you. Could be adultery. Could be a thousand things. Those are temptations that we face. And we face them in a world that's making more and more that as being okay. God does not cause you to be tempted. We know that from James 1, 13 and 14. God does not tempt us. He's not the cause of our testing. There's other forces in play, aren't there? You know that and I know that. He doesn't want us to be slaves to him or to the evil one. And he made it possible for us to have free choices. When tempted, you have a free will choice to follow the temptation or to pray to God for strength to overcome it. We have to stand up, my friends. In this current culture that we're in, we need to stand up to the severe pressure that we're facing to compromise our values and our principles. I think it's a lot like Peter, and he failed. I'll protect you, Jesus. If anybody comes on you, and then he turns around and denies Jesus three times when Jesus needed him most if he was going to have a protector. Or how about the strength that we can hear about Daniel in the lion's den? When he stood strong, he was being tested. He, could, he knew his life was passing before his eyes, but he said, I will not deny my God. And God came through. My friends, satanic oppression 
will come to us full force. If we dabble in things that this world would consider normal, the world that we're in today, 2021, the normal things would be casual sex or seductions to pornography or destructive use of alcohol or drugs. It's legal, why not? That's what the world says. They call it the new normal and it's deceptive. It's subtle and it's powerful. The evil one's goal is to deceive and destroy. Deceive and destroy God's children on this planet. So in conclusion, my friends, pray the Lord's Prayer daily, fiercefully, and repeatedly over the days and weeks ahead. Because the evil one is relentless. But our strength comes from God to overcome. We need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to be able to quote scriptures as necessary to overcome the temptations and to know that God is in our corner, God our Father. If your prayer life is a little bit out of balance, and mine is from time to time, in fact, I was talking to someone this week that said the same thing. I have good intentions when my day's starting and then everything seems to fall apart and I never get around to reading the scriptures I intended to read or pray or take time. I happens to be too. Sometimes I don't make the cut very often. I'm surprised sometimes where I can have two or three days in a row go. I could justify it. Oh, well, that guy was coming at 9 o'clock in the morning. That's my normal prayer time, but I'll get to it later. And the uh, get later never happens. Too many things interfere. So, my friends, in conclusion, I would like to say this. Review Matthew 6, 9 to 13. Review it again in your Bibles at home, on your phone that you've got scriptures on. Study those words. Look for the pattern that Jesus teaches us to live a balanced prayer life. Start by saying the Lord's Prayer and then include all the other things that are important so you just don't race through it in 20 seconds. Maybe it'll take 20 minutes, but it'll be the best 20 minutes you've ever given. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us how to pray. Amen. Father God, we know that you are God and we're not. We know that you taught us to pray and we're thankful. Help us to take it sincerely. Let us to review your word and pursue the possibilities that we could be closer to you as God our Father. Amen. Wonderful opportunity to stand and share in the one truism that is important to us. The Apostles' Creed declares all the things that are in the scriptures that make us faithful. Would you join me? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried, and he descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Now comes our time to pray. And it's not a surprise that you'll discover our opening prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Remember, that's an outline. That's where you, you take line by line, word by word in some cases. So it'll stretch from that short little 20 seconds to a much more meaningful time with our Lord. O oh Lord, show us your mercy. O oh Lord, save our nations. 
Clothe your ministers with righteousness. O Lord, save your people. Give peace in our time, O Lord. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create us in us clean hearts, O God. The collect for this season. Blessed are you, gracious God, creator of heaven and earth. We give you thanks and praise through Jesus our Lord. In fulfillment of your promise, you put forth your Holy Spirit upon us, filling us with gifts and leading us into all truth. You give us power to proclaim your gospel to all nations, to our neighbors, to our friends and family, and the power to serve you. Therefore, we join our voices with angels and archangels and with all those in the whom the Spirit dwells to proclaim the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Together, the prayer for peace. O oh God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you is eternal life and to serve you is perfect freedom. Defend us, your noble, in all assaults of our enemies, that we may truly trusting in your defense may not fear the power of any adversaries the might of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This prayer is a meaningful prayer also for your personal prayer time. If you haven't got that one, it's in your prayer book. If you don't want, if you don't want it, I can email it to you as well. But it's important to know we are entering into a very savage time. Very, very difficult. What we just experienced for 11 days in Israel could very well be spreading all over the world because there was not peace granted. That was just a truce. There is things going on in this world that the evil one is trying to really talk, go topsy-turvy on us. So pray this prayer and others like it so we can be ambassadors for the truth. Peace can only come through Jesus Christ. And of course, grace. Grace being that wonderful gift that God gives us, that he forgives us despite what we do. God's gift. I'm going to share something with you that I came across this week, and it's something that very familiar. A dear friend of mine often refers to karma. He thinks he's being sophisticated. You know, karma. It's a Near Eastern religion quote. There is no such thing as karma. But he thinks it's wonderful to be able to share it. You know, people get what they deserve, good or bad. That's his context, right? And there's an increasing experience right now in our Western cultures. Many Christians, I believe, think in some form of karma. Jesus never said anything about karma, karma at all. But sort of implied you could be a Christian and believe in karma. You can't. Karma says you get what you deserve, good or bad. Here's the difference. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, says, I will give you what you need. Freely. I will give you what you need, not what you deserve. Forgiveness and grace. Grace is getting what you need, my friends. Not what you deserve. Thank God. Would you pray with me? Our Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and everlasting God, you brought us safely to the beginning of this day. Defend us by your mighty power that we may not fall into sin nor run into any danger and that guided by your spirit, we may do what is righteous in your sight through Jesus. Amen. And together, Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that whenever two or three are gathered together in your name, you'll be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Wonderful to be together you in this morning prayer service. We'll be again together next week. As you probably have noted, everybody here is operating under the protocols required. We do pray that indeed they'll be lifted as less and less people are being affected by COVID. We pray that you do that same prayer. Lift the people that you love to be protected 
love those who are, who are making the decisions to make the right choices sooner than later, I pray, so that we can worship together. Those of you that are on YouTube, I am so thankful that you're with us this morning. We hope you've been touched by the messages, by the hymns, by the words from God, these ancient words that mean so much. And for those of you that are still saying, well, I haven't got around to the Zoom Bible study. What you think about it? Would you find a way to make it happen? It's a 40 minute time. It's joyous. It's well led. We learn things. We laugh together. I'm telling you, I cannot, I, I regret it when I have to be away and miss that. I really do miss it. <laughs> so you will too. If you can start coming, you'll be blessed. Let us share the grace. Let us bless the Lord. And the grace, grace of our, of our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Christ and, and the, the love of God, God and the fellowship, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit be with us all. Wonderful to share that. Gordon, what's your hymn going to be? Well, our closing hymn this morning is Take My Life and Let It Be. So would you please join me? serve our Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Look forward to seeing you next week and do consider coming to our Bible study on Wednesdays at 11. God bless you.